At this point, we can successfully get, post, put, patch and delete. We can validate this by asking BHAT to run against our album feature. And once complete, we should have six passing scenarios. Whilst implementing the raw Symphony 4 JSON API and also at various times throughout our FOSRES bundle implementation, we covered some of the unhappy paths and we do already have a separate BHAT feature for this. This is the album Symphony 4 edge cases feature. The idea of this file is to check what happens when things go wrong. And as discussed previously, this file is expected to be slightly different depending on our implementation. So the way the errors are displayed by the raw Symphony 4 approach is going to be slightly different to that which is displayed by default in our FOSRES bundle implementation. And it's going to be completely different to the way that API platform and our CoA.js implementations work by default. So you can see that when our test fails, BHAT gives us this big chunk of output. And in my opinion, this is a little bit hard to read. It's particularly hard to read when working on a small screen like we are here. And in this particular instance, when you look at these bits of output, they kind of look similar. You know, all the errors are there. We're getting back a 400 code. It's just that top level keys and values that are slightly different. Now I've said it a few times already in this course, but my recommendation is that when you hit up on a problem like this in your BHAT test, Go into the BHAT test itself, take the input and run it through Postman or whatever client that you're using and take a look at the output that you get. Because often it's a lot easier to see when it's on your screen as it would be in sort of the real world rather than when you get the output from a failed test. And then if still not particularly obvious, compare and contrast the output that you get to that which you're expecting in your BHAT scenario. So you can see here that during the process of serialization, FOSRES bundle has added in the concept of a code and a message, and we expect to be getting status, which is set to error. Now we have two options here. We can either create a completely separate test, which only focuses on the output of errors for FOSRES bundle, or we can modify the output to meet the requirements of our test. Now I'm choosing to go with the second option, but in my opinion, the first is just as valid. Our situation of having multiple implementations of the same API is somewhat unusual. So there's really no precedent here. Now, if you remember back in our Symphony 4 JSON API without FOSRES bundle, when it came to converting a form instance that had errors into an array, we had a bit of a hard time. Well, we kind of would have had a hard time, but we actually stole the implementation for this task from FOSRES bundle. And we saw that FOSRES bundle largely borrow their implementation from JMS Serializer. Now, FOSRES bundle will happily transform or more accurately normalize the errors from our Symphony form into a plain old PHP array. We don't even need to do anything or enable anything. It just works. And this works because form error normalizer is tagged as a serializer.normalizer. And we can see this in the friends of Symphony rest bundle config serializer.xml. Now there's a bunch of other normalizers brought in automatically when we install the serializer. And you can find these by searching for anything tagged with serializer.normalizer. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. For now, I'm gonna hit shift twice, which will allow me to search anywhere in the project for a file. So I'm gonna search for form error normalizer, which will take me directly to the implementation. And the important method in here is the supports normalization method. The form error normalizer implements normalizer interface. This is an interface provided by the Symphony serializer. This interface defines two methods which anything that implements normalizer interface must contractually provide an implementation for. These are the normalize and supports normalization methods. We can see that this class supports normalization if the given data is an instance of form interface and crucially whether that form has been submitted and the data contained in that form is in an invalid state. Now if the outcome of a call to supports normalization returns true, then the normalize method will be called. And you can see here that we've got this array that's returned that includes code and message and also errors. This is good. We've found the code that we need to work with in order to reach the outcome that we desire. Now a few moments ago when we looked at the serializer XML config, we saw that our form error normalizer service was tagged with serializer.normalizer. This isn't the only service with that tag. And even though this service has a priority of negative 10, this is still the highest priority service with the serializer.normalizer tag that's currently configured. So you may be wondering what else has that tag? Well, the quickest way to get a definitive answer is to check the container. Now there's two interesting things to note here. First of all, we have this big service definition for our serializer. And the serializer gets two collections. The first is anything tagged with serializer.normalizer and the second is anything tagged with serializer.encoder. Now because we've just searched for serializer.normalizer, 
then we're also going to see anything that's tagged with serializer.normalizer. So what we should find here is if we step through all of these different service definitions, then these tags should match up with whatever's been registered in the serializers collection of normalizers. But how does this happen? So again, double click in shift to search anywhere in the project, and I'm going to search for the serializer pass. So behind the scenes, when the container is being built, there's a bunch of these compiler passes that take place. And we can see in here that in order to set up the serializer, we'll have this concept of a serializer.normalizer tag and the serializer.encoder tag, which is both of what we've just seen here. And then for each, it's going to try and find any services tagged with those tags. And then it's going to go ahead and build our collections based on what services it can find with those given tags. As you can see, we must tag at least one service with both serializer.normalizer and serializer encoder. Otherwise, we're going to get this runtime exception. Now, we don't need to worry about that because this comes pre-configured. Now, the process of a compiler pass is really interesting and you can actually use it in your own projects. So if at all interested, then I have a short course on this where we implement our own compiler pass. So from my point of view, there's no point reinventing the wheel here. Inheritance can help us. If we create our own custom form error normalizer, which extends from the form error normalizer that FOSRES bundle provides, then we can get all the benefits of the existing implementation and just tweak the output slightly. So I'm going to create a new file, the form error normalizer.php, and notice this shares the same name as the class provided by FOSRES bundle. Now, as I want to reuse the name form error normalizer for my class, and that name is already in use, I need to use the form error normalizer from FOSREST bundle as something else. In this case, FOSREST form error normalizer. You can call it whatever you want, or you could just rename your class. A little gymnastics may be required to keep PHP Storm happy here. So as this new class extends an existing class that's already set up and tagged, everything just continues to work. However, now there is a more specific implementation, and this is going to be used instead of the class provided by FOSREST bundle. In order to customize our output, we need to override the normalize method in our parent class. We can let PHP Storm generate an overridden normalize method, but by default, it's just going to fall back to the parent. Regardless of how we want to customize the output of the normalize method, we have to return an array. Now, for complete clarity of what the parent's normalize method is doing, if we click through, we might as well just take a copy of that and pop it inside our own normalize method. This gives us a base of reference to work from. For our needs, we don't need the code and message key value pairs. If we look at our bhat test, what we actually want is the status of error and then this errors key, which contains all the form errors. So let's add this into our array. The status of error is really simple. It's just two strings, but the concept of the errors is a little bit more complicated. So why don't we just try and defer back to the parents normalized method and see where that gets us. So in order to test this, I'm just going to remove all them return statements, the leftover cruft, and then I'm going to send in a manual request with Postman. So the output here is quite interesting. It almost looks right, but we've got errors nested inside errors. And this is to be expected because as we've already seen, this is the exact array that the parents method returns. Now, if it's an array, we can do something a little bit sketchy here and just use one of the keys from that array on our call to parent normalize. Now, in reality, this is too trivial an implementation for the real world. At least we'd need a try catch and some defaults or fallback values. However, for the purposes of this demo, I'm okay with this. It shows how to hook into the normalization process and it does meet our test requirements, but honestly, I wouldn't go with this in the real world. But the good news is our FOSREST bundle JSON API now behaves exactly as our raw Symphony 4 JSON API. And even though the internals are different, the outcomes are the same. So that's our FOSREST bundle implementation done. And in the next section, we're going to repeat this process again, but this time using the API platform.